Uh, we are very, very lucky here in Kentucky to have an agronomist such as David Williams to Dr. Williams to uh, study this plant and basically provide our farmers with the inf information they're going to need to know how to grow this. I mean, the, this, the research we're, he's doing and the research universities are doing is public knowledge and something that absolutely has to happen, and that's kind of why we got this whole thing together in the first place. So, uh, without further ado, David Williams, University of Kentucky. Thanks, Josh, very much. I'm very happy to be here. My office is right across the street. That's the main reason I'm happy to be here, right? So I didn't even have to drive here today. Uh, so I am an agronomist. I'm going to ask quickly, what does that mean to you? In a nutshell, the science of agriculture, plant science, soil science related to production agriculture at some level. So that's exactly right. Uh, I work for the University of Kentucky. What does that mean to you? Yeah, go Cats. Uh, UK is Kentucky's land grant university. We share that with Kentucky State University, uh, but uh, UK was the first land grant in Kentucky, and all land grants have a three pronged mission, which is research, teaching, and outreach. Outreach is extension. Uh, how many of you have ever talked to an extension agent, right? They all work for UK uh, in Kentucky, so that's what extension is. We have faculty extension specialists. There were some in the back of the room they evidently had to leave. Uh, so uh, that's our extension or outreach prong. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that uh, I have a deep, real appreciation for the history of him, as Mr. Graves just described it so eloquently. Uh, but really, to me, him is more of a commodity. Okay, it's not really in our world in research, unlike corn or unlike soybeans or unlike wheat. It's a commodity. It's my job to provide science-based information to Kentucky producers so that uh, hemp might be profitable in their enterprise. That's what I get paid to do. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the industry in general, some of our work last year, and finish up with our plans for next year. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and note uh, it's fortunate to be this late today because you can make references to all the previous speakers, right? So Mr. Graves mentioned a tobacco meeting. All commodities have commodity meetings. There are corn meetings, there are soybean meetings, and tobacco meetings, and now we're we'll having a hemp meeting. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with Mr. Graves in one regard. He said this kind of looked like a tobacco meeting. I would offer that no other commodity on the planet, no exceptions, uh, has the diversity of people interested in it that industrial hemp does. You don't see this group of people at a corn meeting. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Uh, so and, and that's not bad. Actually, it's fun. It's, from my perspective as a UK employee, I'm enjoying that more than I can even express. So uh, uh, it's been a great ride so far, and we are very, very excited about the future and, and what our research, uh, uh, what direction we're going to go. We mentioned uh, you know, the press that we received. Uh, it's just unbelievable. There is broad public interest in this crop uh, as expressed by interest by the media. And so that's wonderful. Good exposure. Uh, we expect that that will be a little less this coming year. Frankly, I'm hopeful it will be a little less because I do have work to do beyond uh, you know, answering those kinds of calls. It, it's part of my job, so I'm going to continue to do it. About the work that we had at UK last year, take some of this information with a big giant grain of salt okay there were some uh, some issues involved uh, with the work at UK that were unavoidable not anyone's fault uh, and I'll address those uh, as we go through this but uh, essentially what we did was uh, conduct three different concurrent variety trials with the same 13 varieties uh, that the Kentucky Department of Agriculture provided to our program uh, they were all Italian fiber varieties, at least to the best of my information. That was the situation. Uh, we didn't know that. Uh, what we knew about him, the day we received that seed, you could have stuffed in a thimble and had space left over. Uh, which reminds me to say, I would offer that in the United States, with maybe a few exceptions in states where cannabis is a different crop and legal, uh, I would offer that where we live, there are no experts yet. There are those of us that are reading ferociously. Uh, we are uh, conducting research and growing the crop and so forth. But at least in my world, a true expert has experience. You can read all day long. 
thank goodness for all of us that MDs are not MDs the day they graduate from medical school. They require years of training after reading for four years before they, you know, so we're not experts yet, but we're working on it and working very, very hard on it. Uh, this is one uh, step in that direction, right? This is the first crop we grew. Uh, we learned a lot from this first experience. I'm still not an expert. If anybody calls me an expert, that did not come from my mouth. I'm not ready to say that yet. But we had uh, one trial for fiber production, one seeded at a, a reduced seeding rate for grain production, and then we grew a, a, a separate set to evaluate for the cannabinoids, and clearly THC, uh, but the other cannabinoids as well. Uh, we also had these trials, uh, identical sets of these trials at uh, Western and Bowling Green, and at Eastern and Richmond. Anybody here from Eastern? Not today, and uh, my friends from Western uh, couldn't be here today, uh, but they were excellent collaborators, and I really, really appreciated uh, all the work they did for this work. Good old fashioned grain drill, you know, nothing fancy. Again, we didn't know what we were doing, uh, but it ended up uh, being planted about probably a month late uh, relative to the optimal, at least based on what we've read, optimal seeding date uh, for Kentucky. And that was because of the issues with uh, obtaining the seed and so forth. Uh, nobody's fault in particular, but uh, so we have to take this information with a grain of salt because we could have maybe had 30 additional days of vegetative growth. What, what is the optimal? So, yeah, you know, probably towards the end of April, early May. Yeah, we, we wouldn't have been. Now, that's a caveat. There's lots of caveats there. Uh, it depends on what you're growing it for, and then it depends on the variety that you've chosen, and there are lots of different uh, different things that go into determining the optimal planting date. In the case of these fiber varieties, early May would be the optimal five, or, uh, seeding day. So this is not complicated. That's actually quite simple. Uh, so a mere seven weeks after seeding, I'm five foot nine. Uh, so it's about five foot tall in, in, in about uh, seven weeks. That's, uh, that's pretty cool, six weeks or so, I guess. Uh, and then at the end of the growing season, this is a great indication that we really didn't know what we were doing. I don't mind admitting that. Uh, you know, I don't know everything about anything. Uh, so, you know, and clearly I don't know everything about industrial hemp. Uh, so this is way too mature. I remember Phil, Phil, you in the room? No, he stepped out. Oh yeah, there he, okay, he stepped out. He visited this, this plot at UK late in the year and he kind of chuckled. And uh, I've learned a lot from Phil. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, at the end of the season, you can see it's closer to eight foot tall. So that's pretty good, right? That's not probably maximum or optimal for these varieties, but uh, it was pretty good. I will note that the biggest grain of salt that we have to uh, consider when we look at the data slides coming up here is that the germination of, among those 13 varieties uh, varied from about 38% up to about 88%. So, yeah, what that means is out of 100 seeds, 38 germinated or 88 germinated. And so if you uh, look at some of the data from the varieties that only 38 seeds out of 100 germinated, clearly, you know, the yield is much lower in those plots. And uh, this is the actual trial, and I'm not sure how well it shows up, but that's a plot and essentially has no hemp in it, and some other plots are nearly 100%. Uh, so, you know, the higher germinating ones uh, uh, did much better. We did not have the opportunity to perform germination testing on these lines prior to seeding, so we seeded them all at the same rate. Uh, I felt personal pressure, no political pressure, uh, from Kentucky or UK to get it done that quick. But uh, we, the anticipation up until the day we received the seed was horrible, and so we planted it the day after we received it, and uh, did not uh, have germination is there a testing. The germination rate is that low with the seed? That's a great question. Why was the germination rate so variable? Uh, there are genetic reasons potentially for that to happen. Uh, there are physiological reasons for that to happen. It could be less mature. Uh, it could have been stored improperly. Well, we have no idea where the seed came from. Uh, how it was stored in the interim, and then clearly we have no idea how old the seed was. If it was uh, 10 years old, or uh, you know, how was it stored? Yeah, so there's so many answers, answers questions. Same uh, bag. I'm sorry. Same bag. Same bag. Same bag of seed. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I received 13, 13, 13 bags of seed, each one a different variety. Yes. Yeah. And so samples from that one bag of seed. The germination percentages range from about 38% to 88% among those 13. That make sense? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so what did we see? Uh, we did not see significant damage from insect or disease pests in Kentucky or at Lexington uh, or at the other two locations as well. So that's good, but I don't want you to think that they don't exist. Uh, this plant has not been grown at scale in Kentucky for decades. Uh, there are fungi that will enjoy industrial hemp. There are insects that will enjoy industrial hemp. So when it becomes more widespread, uh, we will increase the populations of those fungi and insects that enjoy it. Uh, so their, their, their populations are moderated somewhat today by the lack <coughs> of this species of plant, but they will increase with time. And we'll deal with that as, as it goes along. Yes, sir? Uh, what, durability, I'm not sure what that means exactly, I apologize. Which one produces the good crop? Right. Right, and that's a, that's a great question. So I'm going to show you some, some numbers here in just a moment. Hopefully I'll answer that question. And the young lady at the front says, everybody wants to know which one to pick. <laughs> well, right. I would offer the first problem is everybody wants to find any variety today. Yes, it's very difficult to find seed today. But I'm going to address that exact point more uh, very soon. A uh, little bit of fungal activity that we, that we notice, not yield reducing level, okay, not a big deal, but uh, at least enough to, to take a few good photos of. Uh, harvesting. Uh, I, I really uh, am anxious to learn much, much more about this portion of hemp as a crop. There's so much we don't know and understand about optimal protocols for harvesting and processing, especially for fiber. Grain, much less of an issue. Combines work well. We have the infrastructure pretty much, and Mr. Graves and his friends are expanding that infrastructure today in Kentucky. Very positive uh, that redding hemp stalks in the field for optimal fiber quality is not a simple matter. It's not, it's, how many of you make hay and sell it? Anyone here make hay and sell it? If you make hay for a living and sell it for profit, you understand there's an art to that. It's, you don't just go out and mow some grass and then a few days later come and bale it. It is not that simple. The same thing is true for redding hemp. There's lots we don't understand about it. It sounds easy enough. Mow it down, wait six weeks, get out the round baler. You're ready to rock. It's not like that. Not like that at all. And we can't provide you with quantified or quantitative information today. This much moisture, uh, this this many degree days after mowing. We we don't know. Nobody knows that. It's not been quantified. So that's kind of our role too. You all do the fertilizer about 10, 10, 10. You have set standards on when you The question is, uh, did we fertilize? Uh, the, the site we chose uh, had over 7% organic matter, and if you understand agronomy, uh, you understand that means lots of nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus and potassium levels in our soil are off the chart, not limiting to plant growth, so it wouldn't matter how much of those we applied, and we had enough nitrogen inherent in the soil. It had been in grass for 30 years, right, so a ton of organic matter, so no, we did not fertilize. Uh, this, this, this uh, we harvested our grain by hand, right? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, we're talking plots here. We're not talking acres. Yes, sir. Uh, did you put a test on a plot that I put a bed and turn it underneath so it gets nitrogen, or did you just turn it around and crop it? So uh, I think I understood your question. The, the, these plots were uh, grown uh, following conventional tillage. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of some farmers in Kentucky that use no-till drills and uh, did so successfully, uh, but there's still more we need to quantify about that as well. So uh, our cannabinoids, we harvested those by hand as well, so just going, going through the plots and snipping off female flowers, uh, I mean, look at that, it's way too mature. I'm, I'm absolutely happy to admit that we did not know exactly what we were doing. All this came from uh, often anecdotal information from the internet and often honestly, from marijuana production. Uh, there are no refereed sources of information uh, for CBD production uh, because it's a brand new industry. Nobody's researched it. That's selfishly one of the reasons I'm so excited about it. I can probably publish my rear end off 
because there's nothing in the literature, right? And that's, a, that's by the way, one of the ways I'm evaluated, how many publications I produce. Yeah, win-win, right? <laughs> so, good deal. So, you have too, too mature, so that our information will not be perfect. It will not be perfect, but we've learned from these, from these situations, and we will improve uh, as time goes by. Here are some numbers somebody asked, but uh, we had a range. Uh, this is uh, the, the yields of, of fiber from the 13 varieties that each bar represents a variety, and you'll see that we had very low yielding and uh, much better yielding varieties. These are not uh, at the level that we would expect to see today uh, under optimal planting, optimal management, and so forth. But we uh, harvested about five tons per acre of dry fiber from, from the maximum yielding plot this past growing season. So you've already heard numbers uh, from Tim and others, but that's really almost a drop in the bucket nowadays. So we, we know for sure through genetics and most especially through management that we can do much better than that. Uh, and we, we certainly expect that to happen. Whoops, excuse me. So the trial at Eastern and Richmond and Western and Bowling Green, you'll see their yields are a little bit lower. Uh, that could be possibly because we planted it after we planted ours, uh, so a few less days. Uh, you're likely to see it lay there until it rains or until you irrigate it, but you're also likely to see many weeds that are fully capable of germinating at that same soil moisture. And if the weeds get a head start, depending on what they are, uh, that's not a good situation. Uh, I've heard somebody also mention today already about uh, we don't have any uh, chemical tools in hemp management. That's exactly true. No products in the United States, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, no products are labeled. And so that means if you spray them on a hemp crop, that's off-label and that's purely illegal. Uh, you, know, it's rob you can rob a bank, uh, right? That's illegal. That's a, 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 an extreme analogy, but uh, it's breaking the law. It, it, it's breaking the law if you apply herbicides or any other pesticides to industrial hemp yet. So the key is we need more soil for germination uh, at, right at planting. And uh, if, if you're a farmer, you understand what's too wet and what's not wet enough. Uh, but, but we need to actually quantify that as well for those that are maybe not farmers. But that helps explain why the, the, uh, the yields might have been different. Uh, these two graphs, uh, that's the same graph we just looked at from the UK uh, with the fiber yields uh, plotted at the same time as the germination, right? So clearly there's a relationship. If, uh, if you don't get a full stand, you're not going to get very good yield. And uh, our germination did rate, uh, range from about 38% up to about 88%. And uh, big difference there. Uh, so our grain yields uh, were not excellent. You heard uh, Tim again mention uh, at least a ton per acre uh, is kind of normal these days. Well, we, we got about a little shy of 900 pounds per acre from our top yielder. These are not grain varieties. These are fiber varieties. Uh, so, you know, genetics can play a large role in that. Uh, but more importantly, uh, knowing what you're doing plays a much larger role in that than I, I think even the genetics do. So, again, we're learning as we go. So, talking about the history, uh, if you can see this, if it's not too low, so that's my wife's dad. Uh, my wife is a native of Bourbon County, Kentucky. Uh, this uh, is actually on my uh, father-in-law's family farm, uh, the Clark Fayette County line, and uh, this is how they used to harvest hemp seed. If you see this white tarp laying on the ground in these piles of hemp that have been cut and are laying out there in the field, they would drag that tarp to a pile of hemp and throw the pile on the tarp, and you can see these sticks, and that's how they removed the seed from the hemp. That's how they harvested hemp seed. Uh, my gosh, he does not have fond memories as a young man in farming hemp. Yeah, not, not positive at all. Uh, now, clearly, we, we don't do that anymore, uh, but it's kind of an indication of how things change with time, right? And that's a good... Uh, segue into saying, you know, even the information we have from Europe, uh, from Asia, from Australia in particular, uh, it's excellent information and it's the best starting point ever. We don't know. Nobody here has personal experience and certainly replicated research to back up many statements. 
So we take advantage of uh, our friends from Australia and uh, in the refereed literature from Europe and so forth, but it's an indication that things will change probably even relative to the information that they're willing to share with us about agronomy of hemp in Kentucky. Uh, you know, we, we definitely come a long way from thrashing seed with tobacco sticks and uh, we, we hope we don't ever return to that. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, research plans uh, for this year and perhaps beyond. <coughs> I've mentioned to a couple of you that are in the audience, I've kind of changed the focus of my talk from this point forward. Uh, rather than being specific about research projects, I thought maybe I'd talk a minute about research in general. Uh, because I, one thing I've learned uh, in, in uh, communicating with many of you and many others that are not here today is that uh, within this industry, the diversity is such that uh, you may not be a part of commodity agriculture today. And if you're not a part of commodity agriculture today, then you're not maybe familiar with terms like varieties and terms like variety trials and terms like replications and some other basic agronomic terms that uh, are part of my brain, right? But they may be unfamiliar. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about that because it kind of provides a framework of where our research is grounded. Um, variety trials, uh, we will conduct variety trials in 2015 for fiber, grain, and for cannabinoids. Uh, if you can see this photo, this is a wheat variety trial conducted at the North Farm here on the uh, Spinapop Farm in Lexington. And if you look, you know, you have a, a plot that's way greener than another plot, uh, that's greener than another plot. And so those are individual germplasm sources or individual varieties of wheat. And you can see that they look different, right? So the same thing's true in hemp. So what is a variety trial? We plant different varieties of wheat or hemp and in the same area, and we have at least three plots of each variety, sometimes four or five, depending on how much difference there is in the soil at this area or some other factors. So we have at least three replications of each variety. And we manage the entire trial exactly the same. Right? So all of these wheat varieties, all of these hemp varieties are managed the same. Then at the end of the year, well, well actually during the year, we'll probably collect some growth information and so forth. But at the end of the year, we'll measure yield of whatever the commodity of interest is, whether it's fiber, whether it's grain, whether it's cannabinoids. Uh, we'll see which of those varieties managed like this in Lexington had the highest yield or the highest quality or the most rapid growth or any number of other things. This is where the information comes from. Which variety do we choose, right? These trials are what provides that information. So we conducted one trial last year with 13 varieties that we didn't know anything about. Nobody's fault, right? It's just the way, it so we don't know which varieties do better. Nobody does, nobody knows that. We know which ones do, do great in Australia. We know which ones do great in France, right? We know which ones do well in Great Britain. We have no clue which ones do well in Lexington or in Bowling Green. We don't know. That's what variety trials are. And uh, don't forget the <clears throat> Absolutely, yes, yes. Well, we're gonna do a little collaborative work with Pikeville, I believe, this year. I'm not sure what the depth of that collaboration will be, but I look forward to it. So uh, another picture of variety trials, right? Uh, they can be very, very large, depending on the commodity. How many varieties of wheat are there? I don't know, hundreds, hundreds, right? Well, one of those entries of 13, were, they, were, they, were any of them similar to what we had in Kentucky back then? So the question is, were any of the 13 varieties similar to what we had in Kentucky back then, right? Probably not. Okay. I think most of the, as I heard somebody mention already, probably Tim, uh, that the heritage of most of the Kentucky hemp back in the day uh, was probably Asian. And uh, I, I guess all hemp ultimately is Asian in heritage, uh, but the genetics of the European, Western European uh, lines are probably not as similar as would be some Chinese lines. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, so uh, in addition to variety trials for uh, grain and for fiber, we'll also uh, be looking at cannabinoids. Uh, and this is uh, another uh, spot in my presentation that I'm going to deviate from my original intention. Uh, if you farm at all, or if you have any knowledge of farming, there are several very successful farmers in this room. I apologize for telling you things that you've known all your life. But there are many of us that are not farmers in the room. Uh, how many corn seeds do you plant per acre to achieve maximum corn yields? Right, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, so there is a precise planting rate for corn, depending on the variety that you've chosen, uh, that will ultimately yield maximum, that, that it would be the maximum yield. Uh, how do you plant corn? Do you use no-till planting, or do you use conventional tillage in corn? Any thoughts? Yeah, so somebody figured all this stuff out, right? People in UK, people in Illinois, uh, people in other states have invested a lot of effort in research to figure out if you use this variety of corn, or this type of corn really, uh, you need to put this many seeds on an acre to get the maximum yield. So we know a little bit about that, about him, from other countries. Uh, let me provide another theory. Uh, what if, now this is a hypothesis, all right? I'm not, this is not a statement, it's a hypothesis. What if cannabinoid production from industrial hemp produced under a current tobacco production model was highly superior to cannabinoid production uh, from a industrial hemp grain production model, which is a certain seeding rate, harvesting the plant parts with a combine, and so forth. Would the cannabinoid production from that system equal, exceed, or be less than the cannabinoid production uh, from a tobacco model. So my friends from Australia, I've really enjoyed them for the last couple of days. I've spent considerable time with them. I, I have to say this, a couple of things that really have been fun. They say thank you at the end of about every other sentence. And I, I think we could all use more of that. I think that's a wonderful thing. But then secondly, and I've, I've noticed it before, but today again, uh, how many from Kentucky? Yeah, a bunch, yeah. So they say chatter. Have you noticed that? <laughs> China, that sounds like something we would say, doesn't it? Not over in China. Yeah. So it's, it's a function of, yeah. So I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I say that with, 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 with true respect. And, uh, and, uh, but it's been a lot of fun talking with these guys. But they don't know. Uh, they know a lot, a lot. They're light years ahead of us in industrial hemp knowledge and research, light years ahead of us. To, to hear Tim's presentation today, uh, you know, it, it makes all the difference in the world. If you didn't realize it, Tim is a PhD student at Southern Cross University in Australia. And uh, Phil, you'll correct me please if I misspeak here. Uh, Echo Fiber, which is the corporation uh, that Phil uh, is involved with, represents, uh, funds uh, Tim's uh, assistantship at Southern Cross University. So I'm taking time to say this because today at UK, we have that much funding for graduate students. Mm. And agronomic research is conducted by people like Tim who are becoming researchers for a living. Master's degree students and then and more complex projects like Tim's, PhD level students, and uh, UK doesn't have like a giant pot of money somewhere that they just start hiring graduate students. It, it doesn't exist. And so the industry funds research and Echo Fiber is funding Tim's work. And you heard uh, Tim, uh, Phil uh, say earlier how important uh, university research is. Uh, so that's how much funding we have. Yeah, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I have $13,000 in the hemp research account. And I don't know why I thought at this moment in time it was necessary to tell you that. But it, it's, not, it's not, even, not even enough to fund, it, it's, it's about a third of a graduate student, a master's student. So uh, it's very, very difficult. 
uh, because of the complexity of hemp and marijuana, and uh, there are no federal grants to apply for because it's illegal to grow, right? So I can't apply for U.S. government money. It's not an option. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that over the next few months, maybe even sooner, uh, that many of the corporate entities that are represented in this room today uh, may consider funding work like Phil does with Tim's uh, plant breeding research, or at the very least, forming some type of coalition uh, where uh, it's for the common good, uh, uh, so the entire industry can move forward based on publicly available information from research conducted in UK. So why did I talk about the tobacco production model? We don't know that cannabinoid production will be great from a tobacco production model. Transplanting, uh, removing the male plants by hand like we talk tobacco today. How many of you grow tobacco? Real few, so you know a little bit what I'm talking about. So, you know, pre-emergent herbicides at transplanting would just be wonderful. Uh, precise plant spacing would be wonderful, theoretically anyway. So we need to know these things. You can't own the information from a tobacco transplanting experiment. You know, so a corporation thinks, well, yeah, I'm interested in that. I'll pay for that. Well, you can't own that. That's public information. Transplanting versus direct seeding. You know, nobody owns how the, the information about how corn is planted. That came from public research, like here in UK and in Illinois and other places. So I'm very hopeful, very hopeful, that if uh, we're to move forward as an industry, uh, that uh, there, there can be some uh, thinking along the lines of, uh, well, okay, let me, let me put it this way. If we don't do this kind of research, what are you going to do? How are you going to grow it? Well, you'll probably be successful at some level. But you're going to be doing one thing, and you're going to be doing another, and basically this is what you're doing, isn't it? Right? You're just shooting from your head. You know, you're doing the best you can with what you got with no science behind it. It's somebody's opinion. Right? So, in the back soapbox. Um, yeah, we have no money. We have absolutely no money to forward uh, uh, some of the work that we're proposing here. Uh, we're going to do the best we can with our 13 grand. And, uh, you know, we have a little bit more funding coming in this year, but not a significant amount. Uh, so it's a, it's a tough road to hope. Uh, no agronomic pun intended. But I yeah. have a question on your cannabinoids. Okay. Have you did any research on them from Alaska? The so question, you, yeah, the question is, have, have we evaluated cannabinoids from the 2014 crop? All of that plant material is right across the street here uh, at 40 degrees F in the dark. That's the best we can do to preserve the cannabinoid profiles that existed the day they were dried. That's not optimal. It's the best we can do. We're that close to having our DEA license uh, to buy the standards that are necessary to do the analytical chemistry to test. So we have not tested them yet, no. So you'll lose a THCA compared to the THC? Um, that late THC so, at the beginning of it. I'm not a biochemist, right? Uh, my, my colleagues from Australia can answer that question better. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, the THCA reaction uh, to THC is uh, largely a function of heat. But, yeah, right. And so and that's, I think, sure. largely, yeah. So that's why we've stored them at a constant temperature at high humidity in the dark and wrapped in packages that don't allow light in. So we're doing the best we can. Uh, folks, we need to not worry about what uh, the data from last year is. It was, it's not appropriate. It's not long-term information. It was hugely important administratively, hugely important personally for me to get a, a feel for what we're trying to accomplish and how to grow this stuff. Priceless in those regards. But the precise data we, we accumulated from those trials, whatever. On that, what do you, what do you want in the future? What do we want in the future? Uh, some of these trials that, I, that I've, I've been skipping over here. Yes. And, and right, and so the, these are my opinion of some basic questions that we need to address soon uh, to optimize uh, opportunities for Kentucky producers. Now, this is, this is my thinking, folks. This is not the end-all, be-all. There could be a bazillion ideas in this room that would be really, really useful. So I always encourage you, uh, you know, to express yourselves and. Yes. That makes you an end consumer of what we do in food. 
whatever information that we give you. Yeah, so I'm not so much asking for information as I am asking for questions. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not what did you do that worked, but what do you think might work? Or work better. Right. Exactly that. That's my job, guy. That's what I get paid to do, right? And I love it. I love my job. Eventually, I might get paid to grow. Yep. I'm hoping you will. Yeah. Yeah. I, am, I am very hopeful that you will. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that sincerely. I, so I hope your county agent can provide you with some very useful science-based information over the next few years on how to do so very successfully and properly. Yeah. That's that's what I get paid to do. Yeah. Purpose-side evaluations. Okay. I, I think I've gone too long. I don't even know what time it is. But I, I can't not say this. Uh, if you don't already understand the complexity of pilot program research, uh, you probably do have some level of understanding of that. Uh, I, we would have nothing, we would have absolutely nothing uh, without the efforts of the KDA. And uh, the commissioner, of course, was the, was the guy who, you know, pushing all this forward. But the people who get the job done uh, are speaking next. And uh, they have been beyond cooperative with our research program, gone beyond duty uh, to help us uh, with our work. And I can't express strongly enough how much I appreciate what the KDA has done for UK, and really for everyone, uh, but uh, for, the, for UK in particular. My boss has been very, very cooperative. Our dean here at the College of Ag, very, very supportive of our work. Uh, the Kentucky uh, Tobacco Research and Development Center is involved in our research, uh, and they've been very supportive. Uh, I, I put this fellow up here. I didn't even talk about this. Uh, carbonaceous materials is another potential high value use for hemp fiber. We have some work going with the uh, Kentucky Center for Applied Energy Research. Uh, very exciting stuff, high value fiber. Uh, so it might make fiber way more profitable than it would how are we going to know that? We've got to pay for the research. All right. So, okay. Uh, and then my friends at Eastern and Western, and my colleague here at UK is Rich Mundell. He couldn't be here today. He's working in tobacco research. So with that, I'll try to answer a couple of quick questions, but we're already late. Yes. Uh, what are you doing about grants? What are we doing about grants this year? Uh, are they coming to, on the same place, or are yeah. you Maybe I didn't understand your question. I apologize. Where are you getting your seed this year? Or seed this year. We'll have multiple sources of seed this year. Multiple sources. We can know more about where they come from and how old they are. Absolutely. Like well, yeah. So, yes, the answer is yes in general. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a situation where I personally know. <laughs> but, but, yes, but eventually it will be, right? Yeah, but today it's not. But we have high confidence in our seed sources. Will that be available for other states? Look. Uh, for, to acquire seed, yeah, so uh, there are people in this room that are selling seed, and uh, they've already been announced publicly, but Chris uh, Boucher is here uh, with Canavest, and uh, uh, there are, I think a couple of others, too, uh, probably our Australian colleagues uh, may be in the market to sell some seed, I'm not sure about that, but uh, yeah, there are other sources. Yes? Which, uh, you had mentioned a DEA permit that you were waiting for concerning the CBD loans. Mm -hmm. How long have you been waiting? When did you apply for that? Uh, last fall, the application was made, and I don't mean to sound uh, corny or anything, but I'm, I'm almost positive that the holdup is, is as simple as the retirement of one individual that was a couple of steps up that ladder, and so it, it created a bottleneck, not just UK, uh, and so I think it created a bottleneck in our region, however that's broken down, in, in uh, uh, going through the paperwork. I think it's that simple. Somebody retired and some stuff. Can you stuff. retire anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've got our, our window for selling closing by the hour. Oh, I know there's probably a lot of I'm sorry, you, you, you've misunderstood. The okay. DEA permit we're waiting for is to allow us to buy THC and other cannabinoids for analytical chemistry. It has nothing to do with planting. Okay. You know, nothing. They grew that years ago and it's still sitting in big barrels. I, I don't think I understood. I apologize. Yeah, yeah so you, you have to buy, you have to have pure THC 
or, you're talking about something completely different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's totally different. Analytical chemistry. But if you yeah. process, Captain, what, what you still have to have a DEA, uh, if you're a process, would you still be required to have a DEA monitor? I, I'm not the guy to ask that. I'm an agronomist. Yeah. Adam might be able to address that, I suppose. The next speaker. And that's, I, I'm not avoiding it. I don't know the answer. Yes? If, uh, if the grows like a weed, Would you uh, be able to just uh, disc the soil and broadcast it, or do you have to plant and grow? So the question is, uh, if hemp grows like a weed, which apparently it does, do you need to till first and broadcast? Do you need, well, the, the conventional tillage would be with a plow. It, right, more plow. Okay, could you, instead of plow, because there's a statement in here that that was too deep, some sort of slant is too deep, could you just disc? Soil, if, it, if you're taking over some hay pastures, right. could you just disk the soil? Not without herbicides. No, ma'am. Yeah, you would not be successful without herbicides. So you have to plow. Yes. Yes. Or use no till, which of course means herbicide. Yeah. And the seed would probably have to be at least drug in or rough in. That'd probably make it hurt. Right. Yeah. You want good seed soil contact? Seed, soil moisture planting is imperative. It's success and failure. It's that simple. Plant it in dry soil, have all the grass weeds germinate, you might as well spray it dead and plant something else. Yeah. Is your grain, grain uh, trials primarily focused on oil production and oil yield or is it something else? Yeah, he asked us, does the grain trials focus on oil production or something else? Uh, simply, last year it was simple yield. We have applied for some grants with the Kentucky Science and Engineering Foundation uh, to uh, investigate the quality of hemp oils from different varieties and from different management schemes. So how we, more nitrogen fertilizer, you know, how does that affect the oil profile, as an example, right? So we, we don't know if we'll get that money or not, but last year, no, we didn't do any analysis. It's just simple yield, simple yield, yeah. I'm, yeah. Any other quick questions? We're going to move on, guys. Good, good, good. They did a good job. Good job.